So we're a family of five and we live in a yurt. We've been living off grid for 13 years. We've been homesteading for seven of those 13 years and we'll continue growing and continue homesteading till the end of our days. A lot of people move so many times during their lifespan, but we found the spot and we we're both into it 100%. It was really just wanting to live off the land, wanting to live quietly, wanting to have a peaceful life, living outside, and knowing that we were going to have a family, wanting to connect our children with that and raise our children in that was the biggest driving force. We do really have to watch the weather, but I think that's one of the most beautiful things about living off grid especially when you require the sun for your power and rain for your water. So you're constantly living with the seasons and when you don't have control over it, you don't take it for granted. This is a homestead. We are doing this for food security. We are providing for ourselves. Our goal is to get to as much sustainability as we can, providing for ourselves. So I'm in charge of the gardens to grow as much vegetables as we can. So we do, I do a lot of uh, preserving and canning. We're still eating tomatoes from last year. As the tomatoes from this year are coming in, I, the garden for me in the spring, summer and fall is my full-time job. Uh, and I really enjoy that piece of it. Next project will be a greenhouse, putting a greenhouse up and trying to get uh, extended seasons in our growing so that we can eat more from home year round. It certainly saves a whole lot of money to grow your own food, uh, which is, has been the biggest difference in, for me since leaving my job too, is the amount of money we save by doing our own things at home. So from the garden, we've got canning and sauces and everything for the year. I make soups that I can. And then in, on a regular basis, we still make our own bread, our own butter, our own yogurt, with as many ingredients from home as we can, but we do still have to outsource staples, you know. It's hard to grow a field of wheat when you don't have tractors and big equipment to harvest it. We've tried and failed. <laughs> we grew the wheat very well, but it stayed out there because it's hard to harvest wheat by hand. I think really our goal was to live off the land, but we did it really naively and didn't really know what that meant. And so I didn't picture animals right away and it took us many years to get animals. But in order to be self-sustainable here, we needed animals to work the land. So we have eggs from the chickens and those chickens end up in the, in the freezer. We grow the chickens as dual purpose and then we grow the pigs for the pork. We started selling a little bit here and there and the next year we had to get more pigs because everybody wanted our pig again for the next fall. And we also have the goats and the sheep. Uh, from the sheep's milk, we ended up making cheese this year for the first time. I mastered the feta, I feel. <laughs> and um, from a cow that we're going to have, then we'll be able to have more cow's milk to be able to make uh, more butter and cream, all the nice staples that come with that. So we grow rabbits too, and we also are starting to grow more of the animals for the dog foods, which would be hopefully one day not have to buy kibble anymore. So we do keep bees. Their biggest job really here on the farm is pollination and help in the garden. And then we skim a little bit of extra honey off the top. So we typically do have enough for us for the year, but we don't sell it. And, um, but we use it for baking and we, we eat a lot of honey here. Our kids have been raised in this and so it's, it's part of their everyday. Tasks on the farm for them have grown with their age and their abilities and what we're doing, but we, they are involved in every part of farming. They're involved in chores every day, they're involved in making food, they're involved in helping grow the food. For me, it's just so important. Becca wanted a yurt. And I'm like, oh my goodness, it's a little crazy. Then I was thinking, what's gonna happen with my water? We're gonna have to be here 24 seven or else something's gonna freeze. And then we went to the township and the township said, you need 900 square feet? 900, yeah, 900. 900 square feet of living for a permit. 
the yurt was 700. Then we had talked straw bale, and I liked the idea. So I said, why don't we build the straw bale kitchen and garage and utility room, bathroom, everything that has water so it won't freeze in here. Then we wanted an easy connection between the two and we had pre-ordered the yurt with French doors so that we could put an alleyway hooked up to the kitchen. He was able to build all of this himself. He built the forms for the floor. He laid the flooring inside. He built the straw bale. We parched it by hand. Like it really was from the ground up with blood, sweat, and tears um, putting this place together. And if I would go back, I would have did all straw bale in the first shot, but we had already ordered the yurt. The yurt was a 10-year plan. The plan is to take the yurt down keep the floor, keep the actual footprint, everything's in floor heating. And then I want to put up two-story straw bale so that we have rooms for upstairs. It's getting to a point where the kids are getting older and we need some more space. Mm -hmm. So we will have a round straw bale house in place of the yurt, hopefully next year. So we are completely off-grid, no grid tie whatsoever, with solar panels. Bringing the grid to us would have been incredibly expensive. They have to pay per hydro pole that goes up, the closest hydro poles, more than a kilometer away via yeah. the road. We started with four solar panels, an inverter, and a bunch of batteries. And as the years grew, our consumption got a little bit more. Our need for freezers for all the meat that we do so we went for nine panels at 325 watts each. We started with lead acid batteries to now finally being on lithium, which has a nice warranty for 15 years and are absolutely carefree. So those panels power the whole house. We're powering one fridge, three freezers. Washing machine, the circulating pumps for the floor, uh, lights, but um, pretty much that's it. We did a lot of research into what takes power and what uses how much power so that we could build a system that fit for us. So we don't have anything that plugs into heat because that's going to drain our system really quickly. We use fire for heating the house. We use propane for all of our cooking needs and for our on-demand hot water too. So there's no coffee maker. We don't iron. Nobody toasts toast in a toaster here. <laughs> we still eat toast. We, we still eat toast. Toast it in the oven. So we're very conservative with our appliances. We don't have a TV because we don't want to run a TV. So we really have been choosy about what it is that we're powering. In the winter time, I move the panels up to catch the most sun possible, but the winter you don't get all the sunny days. So we have a backup generator that will start up automatically to top off the batteries and shuts off. The system itself and maintaining a system can be quite pricey and we are always going to need some kind of backup. It'd be nice to not rely on fossil fuels, but we live in a temperate climate and so we do our best to try and offset that with wood, but you know, we'll always need that extra, especially in Canada. So we harvest rainwater as our sole water source for the house. Um, we were only on rainwater on our entire farm until last year. We decided to put a dug well in for the livestock on the farm. That's where most of our water ends up going. But for the house itself, we have rainwater, so it gets collected off of our steel roof and it goes through a fine filter into some big bulk tanks in the garage where it's kept nice and insulated. It doesn't freeze in the winter. We do filter it for drinking on top of that. So we have a tabletop Berkey filter that we love so we can drink it without being concerned. The problem is, is it, you know, we live in Canada. So for months on end, we don't get rain. So we're very mindful of the water that we use and yeah, we, we make do. There's melt in the winter time also, you know, the sun melts uh, some of that snow down onto the roof. And if we are ever in dire straits, we can pump it from the well uh, into the house and we've done that before. It's kept in tanks from dairy farms, so big stainless steel tanks, and we can save 1400 gallons between the two tanks. Uh, we've got a low flush toilet, we only have one bathroom in the house. 
all of our plans uh, for the original house was built around a composting toilet, but it was going to take an extra amount of time for permitting. We had already waited so long for permitting because it's really hard to permit a yurt to live in. And so we dug a regular septic system and with a larger family too, with five, I think uh, a septic system was probably easier to manage. We have an indoor boiler that we set up in the garage. It's a wood-fired indoor boiler, which heats the floors within floor heating, supplemented by a wood stove in the yurt, which burns a decent amount of wood to keep the yurt warm. So we do cut a lot of wood throughout the year, and sometimes at minus 20 and sometimes at plus 30, but it still needs to get done. And it heats our water. The boiler that's in the garage in the wintertime when it's running also has a home hot water. So otherwise we have an on-demand propane hot water heater that we use mostly in the summer. To have insurance, they want two sources of heat, but the on-demand hot water passed us as an alternative source of heat. But with the passive solar, you could leave for the weekend and the yurt will get cold. Mm -hmm. As long as the yurt doors are closed, the kitchen won't freeze. Welcome. We're coming into the garage of the straw bale. So this is a nice big cool space, mostly for storage, for heating. This is what we heat with our wood boiler for the floors and our water storage tank. Uh, tanks are in the other corner, so lots of water storage here. So we come in from the garage into the kitchen, which looks out over the south. Uh, so we get lots of beautiful sunshine. This is uh, one of our communal spaces in the house, so we spend a lot of time in here, and the brightness is just my favorite. Up here we've got the bathroom. Hopefully nobody's in it. And every Strawville house needs to have its truth window, so our truth window in the corner convinces everyone that we do live in a Strawville house. So it's a 16 inch wide straw bale that has about an inch of parging all the way around it to seal it in. Um, the nice thing about that is the parging is porous, so it lets kind of humidity in and out. It doesn't trap it. When you seal it, it becomes inflammable, right? So it's a, it's a very sturdy house. Uh, the R value is excellent, and we've been really lucky to stay nice and warm. It's a good thermal mass to have. So we can run a washer and dryer off-grid, so our dryer is propane for heat and gets used maybe twice a year if we need to. And then the washing machine at the time we bought it was the most efficient that you could get. Um, when it's ready for an upgrade, we'll get a more efficient one, but it has a, its own inverter. So when it spins, it makes its own power. A little bit. Um, so this is the utility room. This is the brains of the operation in here. And so in here we have our entire HVAC and heating system. So we have in-floor heating. And then this is the off-grid system here. So we've got our inverter that inverts the power. We have our batteries, so we just upgraded to these really sleek uh, lithium ion batteries that take up a quarter of the space. It's where we raise worms for our chickens. And it's, uh, this is our grow center also for the, for the spring when we grow, when we start our seedlings. It's nice and warm in here and we have our grow lights in here so that we can start all of our garden. So the only part of the construction of the house that's normal or what we would consider normal construction is the hallway. So it's just simple two by four connection from the straw bale to the yurt to be able to come through to the main living space. So it's pretty easy to quarter it up. We have our dining room uh, where we sit to eat. We have our living room. We have a guest room in the middle on the futon when we have guests. Uh, and then on this side, we've got all of our sleeping areas. So Jean and I sleep downstairs in our master bedroom. The girls have a loft in their upper bedroom. And then Mo has his bedroom at the end. We have plenty of space, so we spend most of our day in this area. We are mostly around the wood stove, the winter time. You know, we read on the couch, we stay warm in here. It's nice and cozy. It's also really dark in the winter when you get the, the sun going down sooner and the, all of the walls are closed and it just feels really cozy, like you're hibernating. So we started looking for land early, knowing it would take us time. We knew we wanted to stay in the area because we were both working in the area. And when we walked onto this land, I think it was very clear that we knew we had found home. Um, there was nothing here. 
There were big open fields, there were big forests. So we ended up buying 68 acres of land. Most of the land is provincially recognized watershed. And so we can't really touch it without permission. But for us, the goal of having that piece of the land is to preserve it and to leave it for wildlife and for biodiversity. Once we're done working through the fields and fencing and doing what we need to do, uh, we should be able to farm about 20 acres. So yeah, we were really fortunate to buy our land in a good price year for realty. But it was also really difficult because we were a young couple, you know, we didn't have kids at the time, newly married, we were both working, we had no equity and we didn't have the money to put down on the land. So we borrowed from family, which worked out really, really well for us. And so when the land was paid off, ah, oh, what joy when you own the piece of land you, you sit on. Uh, but then there's everything, all of the infrastructure, it costs a lot of money. Uh, we were fortunate we were working, both of us full time, so we were able to put money aside and we don't spend a lot of money. But um, the biggest piece was uh, then trying to mortgage or be able to build a house because building a house requires a lot of upfront money. So we did have to borrow again. We were lucky my parents could pull out a credit line for us on their assets, which was great. And then we were able to flip that over into a mortgage after. But there are a lot of costs involved, even working the land. You know, we picked up a 60 year old tractor to work the land that thankfully Jean can fix. And I think that when it comes down to finances and being able to do it financially, we can only do it because Jean has all of the skills to do it himself. So we don't have to call a plumber. We don't have to call an electrician. We don't, you know, we can do most of the thing on our land. That's a really big benefit. So there's that skill set that leads us to an incredible amount of savings just because he's handy, because he can build. I mean, he built this whole thing, right? But the setup is really daunting for a lot of people who are out there looking for land and wanting to start a life like this. It's incredibly daunting. And to build from the ground up requires, yeah, some financial finagling that we were really fortunate to be able to do. So we weren't able to work uh, only on the farm for the longest time. So we both worked full-time jobs off the farm and then started growing the homestead over time. Uh, and that became a little bit challenging. There wasn't enough time in the day. Uh, so I was able to retire from my job. I think the goal in the long run is to have the farm pay for itself. So, you know, we don't have big business plans, but uh, it would be nice to have, to be able to work off of the land and have both of us at home to work off of the land. Cause we really enjoy working together. We do get to, Jean's got a great job right now that allows us the, a lot of time together on the farm. So hopefully we'll get there one day. There's so much joy and passion in what we do, but there are never enough hours in the day. <laughs> Our days are long and it's hard work. So it's more often a 10 to 14 hour day, but those days aren't busy nonstop with all of the tasks and some downtime in between. So, you know, when you're milking, especially, there's gotta be 12 hours in between. So you fill up the space in between anyway. The firewood for the yurt in the wintertime is a lot. We burn a lot of wood to keep this yurt warm, but with the straw bale, hopefully we won't need the fire stove much often, just as on the, on the coldest days. So as much as I really enjoy being tied to this farm and being tied to the land and living from the land, there are times when I need to get away and have a break and have a holiday and we love traveling. So that's a challenge for me is not being able to just pick up and go for the weekend. The other thing I would say about homesteading in general is that it can be really lonely. Finding like-minded people, finding community can be hard when you're homesteading, for sure. We have a lot of new neighbors that want to try to grow enough vegetables for each other. Mm -hmm. So we found more people that we can mm -hmm. share this with, which is awesome. There are four families now involved, and so if you can have four families working together, mm -hmm. then you can reach that sustainability so much sooner, and all locally, right? So. It's something we're really looking into, and I hope that we can make it work. Subscribe to Exploring Alternatives, and please share this video if you liked it. Also, to find out more about Bearbush Homestead, you can visit the link in the description of the video. Thanks for watching.